Right, the timer. Timer. Yeah. <laughs> Look right below you. you have a drawer? <laughs> I'll plug it in. Yeah, and we will introduce new staff. David Case, our assistant city engineer. Ben and everyone else you probably know. Yes. You want me to let you in? Okay. Hi, John. The Zoom meeting. Oh, the part. Emily's job. Wow, that's a lot of lights behind me. Good evening, and thank you for viewing the March 1st special meeting of the Arcata City Council. The meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting with both in-person attendance and teleconferences, teleconference access via Zoom. As this is a special meeting, we will take public comment only on the item on our agenda this evening, which is the city's 2022-2023 fiscal year goals. We will open the meeting with an introduction from our city manager, and we'll then move into the public, um, the period for public comment. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council and community. Um, tonight, the city will be reviewing uh, the goals that were set by your council for the 21-22 fiscal year, and then updating those as really the first step of our budget process for the 22-23 fiscal year. 
Um, staff basically take the goal priority projects that you set tonight and they build the city's budget around our core functions and then try to prioritize with any money we have left over than those priority projects that are set in this process. Uh, last year, the council put really considerable effort into public engagement and stakeholder meetings to gather a huge body of information and set pretty audacious um, and many long-term goals. So you're going to see we had a ton of progress this year that staff are here, very proud of the work that's been completed under this council this last year. But many of the projects were also multi-year projects, and we'll talk about those tonight as well. Um, goal setting is a time of year where we do want to take a minute to stop, to think, to take a breath, to think of our direction and to course correct where we think as a council, you would like to give staff direction to move. Um, that being said, I always like to remind us also that we are healthy financially, but we are not wealthy financially. <laughs> Um, and to take in mind that we are still rebuilding staff levels from the pandemic um, with a lot of support from the council using ARPA funds, but we are still short staffed in most of our departments, but building back. So that is good. Uh, I believe that the process for tonight, we are going to start by focusing on your priority projects. And then as time allows, we'll go through your overarching goals and objectives. And then I do want to introduce our staff quick, and we can also talk if we have time tonight about any individual capital improvement projects um, that you would like to talk about as well. Uh, and all of those lists should be in your packets. There are additional packets. Not a lot of the public here yet. We are uh, live and in person if you want to join us in City Hall, and there are additional packets at the back of the room. Uh, in addition, um, well, I think this is just the time to kind of jump in and let's do maybe a quick round of introductions, um, maybe just starting with the council and then we'll go through staff. Hi, I'm Meredith Matthews. I am, I guess, the newest council member who was appointed in August. I am Sarah Schaefer and I'm also one of the newly elected council members from our 2020 election. And I'm Stacey Atkins Salazar, also elected at the same time as Sarah. I'm Brett Watson. I guess I, I'm the oldest council member. Um, I was appointed in 2017 and elected in 2018. Start with the chief. Yes, hi. Uh, good evening, Brian Ahern, uh, Arcata Police Department. Good evening, Andrea Starzewski, Finance Director. Good evening, Netra Katri, City Engineer. Good evening, Danette DeMello, Assistant City Manager. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members, Emily Sinkhorn, um, Environmental Services Director. And I'm uh, David Loya, the Director of Community Development. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jen, do you want to lead us off back there? Oh, yeah. You can yell from there. Jennifer Dart, Deputy Director. So we have a few new faces and a few that have been promoted. So it's fun for the new team to be in front of you tonight. So with that, we'll turn it back to the mayor to start uh, with priority projects. Great. So our first order of business will be public comment. So if you have any input, the council should consider as we set these 2022 20, um, and 2023 fiscal year goals, this is the time, the time to make that comment. If you um, are here in person, you can make your way to the podium. And if you are on Zoom, click raise your hand. Um, and if you are calling in, please press star nine. And so just for procedural, procedural information, what we've decided to try is to um, kind of mirror what the Board of Supervisors did today and that we will go to people that are calling in um, online first and we'll handle all those calls first and then we'll wrap that up and then we'll go to people that are in person but we're not going to toggle back and forth so if you are um, online and wanting to speak it is really important that you raise your hand and do so during this first part so do we have anyone uh, we do our first speaker is sherry go ahead sherry Hi, good evening, council and staff, and thank you so much for the hybrid format. I think it's, if you guys keep doing this indefinitely, I think a lot of people will be really happy. So really briefly, I think that climate change and sea level rise are the issues that may have the greatest effect on Arcata in the long run. I think it's logical that the local coastal element be finalized 
and approved by the state first, and then build on that from there via the city's general plan. And then after that, a specific plan for the gateway should be completed. And that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Next speaker is Scott. Go ahead, Scott. Um, good evening, commissioners, council members. Um, my name is Scott McBain. I'm a um, business owner here in downtown Arcata and a property owner as well in the city um, that we'd like to eventually develop. And we developed our um, office building here in town as part of the general plan 2020 um, process a while ago. Um, as far as the um, priorities for the coming years for your visioning process, um, the gateway plan is a key part of it. Um, to me, the gateway plan is a is the transformative plan for the city. Um, this is like a big deal um, for, for everybody here. Um, we've been here in Arcata since the mid 1980s. Um, and it's, it's a very important thing for us. And it's a big deal as far as this could be a very good plan for the city or it could have some very significant impacts if not done right. And um, we're very supportive of infill and development as, as I mentioned before, we've done both and are planning to do more, but it's really important that we do this right. Um, when I look at the city of Arcata org chart at the very top of the org, org chart is the citizens of Arcata. It's above the city council. And when the city of Arcata is faced with big project decisions like the wastewater treatment plant, the 2020 general plan update, Plaza Vision, these things were done in an innovative way that was um, foundational with the community-based approach. Um, the general, uh, the gateway plan to, has been done the opposite way, unfortunately, and it's been kind of a top-down approach that the community has had to respond to as opposed to starting at the very beginning and having the community start from there um, and to build support from the community. And I just think that it's backwards. And I'd really like as part of the visioning process and the, and the planning for priorities for the city is to spend some more time on this, um, extend out the timeline, use the facilitators that have been hired for this project and actually kind of start from the community as a as a community-based approach first, and then build up from there instead of this top-down approach. Um, and that'll re help rebuild some of the trust issues that, um, that we have some concerns about with the development of the gateway plan so far. But ultimately, we really want the whole, we want the gateway plan to be good for the future of Arcata. We wanna look back in 20 or 30 years and be proud of what we've done instead of going, oh my gosh, what did we let happen? And it's gonna take more time, in my opinion, to get to that point than December of 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patricia. Go ahead, Patricia. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm probably gonna cover a lot of the things that the last two speakers have covered. Um, I'm just thinking that this might I'm really worried about lumping together the general plan, the local coastal plan and the gateway plan all together and trying to push them through by the end of the year. I think we just, you know, I think as staff is, is you know, is, is tight and um, our city council um, is a little bit, um, or, you know, is, ha has some, um, obstacles right now and I know they're doing a really good job and it'd be nice not to have them have to make these huge decisions with just a few of them um, being able to make the decisions. So I'm really pushing for um, developing community task force uh, forces again like we did we, we do with our plaza task force like we did with the 2020 general plan um, and what we did with our wastewater treatment plant um, when that was developed, they're all backed by the people with task force. And, um, um, you know, there was, there is a lot of pride with our general plan of 2020 and our wastewater treatment plan. So I'd really like to see us kind of go back to um, community task force and separate those, you know, the general plan, the local coastal plan um, and the gateway plan and really, really focus on each one of them. Um, 
the community invol involvement, I know we've been told that, you know, repeatedly told that there's numerous examples of the community engagement, but a lot of those, there weren't a lot of people um, in attendance um, for those. Um, and can we really, really realistically count um, some of our committee and commission meetings um, that were viral? I mean, we could probably count the attendees on one hand uh, for those. So, um, yeah, I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see the public reflected more in building, especially the gateway plan. Um, and I'd like to see the gateway plan taken out um, from the general plan and the coastal plan and be a specific plan. I know in the agenda for tonight, it's listed as a specific plan. Um, which was a little confusing to me because I've heard it listed as a specific specific area plan. I've heard it listed as an area plan. And so I really think it should be a specific plan and we should really give all of these um, due diligence and really, really put some time and effort into really creating some really wholesome, great, sturdy um, foundations for you know the vision of Arcade Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. All right, are there any more public speakers on Zoom? Go ahead and raise your hand. Next speaker is Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Hi, Council. Hello, staff. Um, Council Priority Projects 6A and 6B. Uh, find a way to build more types of housing, complete the K Street corridor and the Arcata Gateway specific plan, draws from the market analysis and the gateway draft based on, quote, extensive and public outreach. Uh, previous engagements have been limited in size and the original focus groups consisted some of 12 and 27. A specific plan should have begun with more, more robust community engagement and awareness. Our canvassing supports the concept that community as a whole lacks clear understanding of this plan. A specific plan should clarify infrastructure details. Presently, the plan is so vague and lacking details that the Planning Commission is constantly asking for way more specifics before they can recommend it to Council. Our wastewater treatment plant will max out long before the plan is partially implemented and let alone with the demand of the HSU housing plans. A specific plan would address building heights, clearly spell out development limitations based on weight water capacity, sea level rise, stormwater variables, parking demands and transportation and circulation. Um, I'll close by saying that I am for infill and I am for affordable housing. I live in a block that stands to see large scale development on three sides of my home. My goal is to see it implemented responsibly. I ask that you don't put the cart before the horse. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Jim. All right, next speaker is Lindsay. Go ahead, Lindsay. Um, hi, I echo everything that the last three speakers said and I just really wanted to add in that I feel like when it comes to the gateway plan and um, you know all of the other specific plans that we really need to get it right, I feel like Arcata deserves a community led um, approach to really meet the future of housing and businesses um, and their needs without compromising the quality of the Arcata community that we all live in. And so that's, that's my two cents, thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, I'm seeing no more public comment from Zoom. Is there anyone maybe just outside of the room that means to be in the room for public comment? No. Okay. Um, so we will move forward. Thank you for those of you that called in. And for the caller that was asking about um, hybrid, this is the new way that we plan to do things. So which um, we also think will be best for engaging more people. So we agree. Okay, so let's um, well, let's jump into our goal setting. So just, um, I wanted to kind of run by um, council what my plans were, and then you can see how that works for you. And we can go from there. So I did, um, I did meet with Karen and really kind of went through all the goals to ask her like, what are some things that she thinks that like, uh, we could maybe cross off because they're mostly done or in progress. And so I was 
thinking and I kind of saw like maybe some missing categories. So I thought what we could do is maybe just go through it one by one, each thing. Um, and then as we're like, say we're starting with number one, which is about um, a homelessness reduction strategy framework. If there's things that we want to add into that one or delete, then we do that. And then um, as we get to other areas, I can um, give you guys some ideas of a couple of categories that I think popped up. And then if there's anything that we didn't cover at the end that you might want to add, then we can do it that way. Does that work? That sounds great. Okay. And then I thought since it's a study session, if we could all just call each other by first names would be a lot easier. That works. Except, okay. <laughs> except for council member Schaefer would like to be council member Schaefer. But other than that, <laughs> okay. So let's just jump in with the first one. Um, so, Okay, so to develop a two to three year homelessness reduction strategy framework, um, identifying initial, initial priority benchmarks to provide or continue to shelter those who are or may become homeless. Um, so we do, we have established the homelessness service working group. And then I think um, the other part of this, what they were meaning was the CERC, the COVID, um, which is now the Community Economic um, Resilience Consortium, does have a housing group that, um, I go to, um, and so I think that that's what was meant in that one. Um, and then we've got A, B, C, and D under that. So the two of them, um, B and D, I'm going to propose that we look at um, for crossing off. Um, B is identify locations and operational funding for a day center. So this was real. This was one of our specific goals last time. Um, the my understanding is that the county is starting to discuss or will be building one in Eureka. And so my kind of thought on that, and again, this is just, I'm just leading in with my thoughts. So I'm not, I'm not saying this is how it has to go, but with all of the other projects that we're doing, um, you know, already for this, it seems like if the county is taking the lead on this, that maybe we just help participate in that process and kind of, it's a big lift for us. So that's my, that's my thought. And then the other one was um, obtain site control of a property to provide transitional and long-term shelter housing in partnership with Humboldt County and Arcata House Partnership. And um, if you'll notice, we have the two Project Home Key grants that are converting those motels. So that is another big part of it, um, that we something that we are actually doing. So it um, seems like that we can continue, it's, that's in progress. And so we can continue with that, but cross that off. So thoughts, what are your thoughts on those guys? Um, I can go first. Um, yeah, I, I mostly agree with this. It just, I don't know, it's hard because I, I really would love to see some sort of, of either day center or even you know more emergency sheltering, especially for all these cold nights that we've had recently um, in Arcata, but it, you know, knowing, and, and again, it's hard to, to talk about work with a lot of these issues because these are such like larger countywide issues. And, you know, especially for funding streams, um, I think, you know, working with the county and even, you know, the state, as we saw, you know, with home key, um, you know, that, that state funding that we were able to, you know, cross this goal off with. Um, so, so I am, um, you know, I am comfortable putting, putting B on the back burner for a while. Um, I would also maybe like to add just a little bit more specific language under item C, um, because I know that we've really, you know, we're about to have implementation of, of the safe parking program and that was made possible, um, with ARPA funds, but something that I really see as a priority and something that I, um, you know, would like is to see that continue to safe camping as well for people that don't have vehicles, um, and to be able to offer something um, you, you know, for, for those that don't have a vehicle to rely on, don't have shelter from a vehicle to have, and, you know, are looking for a place we've seen people, you know, sleeping in doorways, sleeping in tents in the forest on overpasses, you know, et cetera. And so, um, you know, being able to kind of continue that safe parking program and perhaps, um, you know, transition that into safe parking and camping, um, and have just more opportunity for that. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I got on that one. Did you, yeah, cold weather shelter too, and, and warming emergency kind of warming spaces, I think, 
you know, between city owned properties that we have could even be possible. But then again, it's finding the funding to have staffing to be able to oversee that, um, you know, the bandwidth of Arcata House is thin. Um, and so being, you know, able to have folks do that, but I think that's, you know, something that we should look into. Yeah, those are great points, uh, Councilmember Schaefer. I know that, um, you know, this past couple of years with COVID, it's been really hard to have so many people gather together and be in close quarters just because, you know, we had to maintain separation, but um, especially with, you know, some of the nights we've been having, um, the possibility of opening up some kind of emergency warming shelter. I mean, it really was, <laughs> it was really cold the last couple of days. And I, I felt, I think we all really um, were wishing that there was more that we could do. So. So do you, do you think it, I mean, is it, I know it's general, but is it safe to say, does it make sense to staff? I mean, I think that you all can see that we're, want to be a part in any opportunity that comes up for this. So, you know, maybe it's not something that um, we can specifically, specifically do on our own, but like you see where our, our hearts are is for, you know, for providing for people wherever those opportunities do arise. So I'm not sure how you work your magic on that, um, Karen, but, <laughs> um, but if we, I think we just like to be open to opportunities that might come up. Yeah, and I think the continued collaboration on the Homeless Services Working Group is going to keep anything that's coming down the pipeline on the forefront of information for the council. So, I mean, that's really how these projects have come to develop and then come to fruition in the past few years. So. Also, can we talk a little bit about a, I know, because I talked briefly about this with Karen before too, um, that, you know, it doesn't seem at this point possible that we're going to have something Oh, wait, is it different online? Oh, wait, no, oh, okay, hey, not one. I was looking at one. Um, you know, something for 2022, but, um, you know, continue working that and maybe, you know, hope to have something in 2024. And maybe, Karen, if you are able to, like, elaborate a little bit more just on what our options on that are. Sure. Um, the One of the options that um, staff would like you to consider is that we have two utility users tax that come up in 2024. So our standard utility users tax, and that's 3%, right, on electricity, water, wastewater, gas, and your communications, phone, cable, et cetera. And that brings in approximately $900,000 a year for us. And then we have the excessive electricity use tax, which is a 45% tax on those households that exceed what's called electrical baseline by 600%, super complicated, and I'd be happy to explain it. Anyone can call me and we can talk about that. Uh, but that brings in about 160,000 a year. So both of those taxes expire in 2024. So one option would be for us to bring those back to the ballot in 2022, that would mean that we would need to gear up and get those facts out to the community and start to prep for that election. But in essence, if they fail in 2022, um, this community has been very supportive in the past, uh, but then we would have another chance in 2024 if that was our priority. And if they passed in 2022, it would free up that ballot if you wanted to look at other tax measures in the presidential election in 2024. Well, what I'm hoping is that we have, um, you know, we have the several programs that we're trying to get up and running, and um, I'm hoping that they're so successful that people are excited about them and we could, because a lot of things we're paying for with one-time money, like ARPA money, and so that in 2024, we have some like really great programs that we can say, we want to keep these going, the public's liking them, are you willing to help pay for them? So I think, I mean, if there was a way to to get the other taxes on in, in 22, I think that would be ideal, but I also wouldn't want to go about it if, if it was too rushed and we weren't going to be successful. You know, I would want to make sure that we could be, put our best foot forward on that. So um, I guess maybe, I don't know if that's up, something that staff would have a better handle on if we could really get that to happen. Um, what kind of things could we use if we did pass those taxes, could we just use that money for anything we wanted to? Um, so the utility users tax and the excessive electricity users tax are both general fund taxes. So that goes into your general fund. Uh, in 
to, in terms of additional tax ballot measures, that would be the will of this council. If you were, I mean, the, the discussion that was before you the last couple of years has been around um, considering a ballot measure that would support housing programs. So if you were, I mean, right now, the way the, the law works, if you wanted that measure to fund just one specific item, then that would have to pass by a two thirds majority vote. If you wanted it to fund general tax, similar to how we do say our transaction and use tax, our sales tax, um, I think the voters came forth when we did our transaction use tax and said, here are things that we would like this tax to be spent on. And we established the transaction use tax committee then to oversee the spending of that tax and make recommendations to the council over time. Uh, so it depends on how you structure the tax. If you want it to be a specific tax, then it would need to pass by two thirds and then it would be restricted to the uses that the voters chose to support. Um, we passed a specific tax for the open space tax, right? So that was a specific tax that then is only will go towards our open space parks and recreation trails programs. Um, but this would be lots more discussion and decisions based on the council. But the concept was how do we support some of this housing long-term for programs that we want to do in our CADA, but the state and the federal government is not funding right now. Um, I did the, uh... The campaign for the um, the measure A uh, ballot measure, and um, it was just me and two uh, high school volunteers, and it was just a, took a couple months. Um, I think it passed with uh, like eighty percent, um, and uh, so I think it would be very um, feasible. Um, you know, as long as um, you know the staff felt comfortable with it, I think it'd be really feasible. Uh what do you, what did the rest of the council think as far as trying to get those utility taxes on for 22? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think moving those up to, to 2022 is a great idea. And then really, I mean, kind of like you said, Stacey, being able to have things that, you know, programs that exist that we're saying, this is what this money is for. We've already built it. We've already created something successful. Now let's fund it even further. Um, and, you know, by 2024, that gives us the time to build those programs and to build, you know, a space to put that money into. Um, and yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with, yeah, that outline of maybe moving those other ones up just so it's not too much on that 2024 um, for people to digest and say, oh my gosh, they want to pass all these taxes all at once. No, no, no. Um, and so, you know, making it stretched out to seem less, you know, in somebody's face, um, but also give us more time to make valuable programs um, and, you know, know what we want to fund basically. So that's where I'm at. I got to be honest, um, I just think, especially, and I hate to bring it, coming out of COVID with people's utility bills already so, so high, and water bills so, so high, I just don't really feel like people are going to rally behind tax, extra taxes right, right now. But it, um, I mean, we'd have to be clear because it's, or, yeah, because like, we'd have to really let people know, like, you already you are already paying them, so it's not increasing them. But I think the, I guess the upside would be is if it didn't pass this time, we it's we would still be getting the taxes until twenty four, and then we would just have to run it again. And then if it didn't, then that's when we're really like, we would have to really come out strong. Like, what is this going to mean to our budget if it doesn't? I don't know. Do I need to? I might feel like I need to recuse myself from talking about electric taxes. <laughs> So I'm just going to, yeah, my recommendation is to always play it safe. And then if you want to review the potential conflict of your job, you know, with that, then absolutely. I'm going to take myself out of that discussion. Yeah. Okay. That, that, no, that's fair enough. So I think that the three of us have consensus on that to try to do it in 22. That's right. Yeah. You're saying right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I was. I would just say that um, it, you know, from our experience, it seems like as long as we give people, um, you know, a clear explanation of what they're going to be used for, it seems like that the voters have been supportive in the past. All right, thank you. Um, 
So I think, is there, um, is there anything else to add to this? Oh, one thing we, um, oh, there, we have a long list. So E is to continue support for Arcata House partnership. And then what I was gonna um, add to that is to say, and support the home key grants, because that is what, what we're doing. Um, and so, yes, we need to keep that. That kind of puts D with E, though we have mostly accomplished D. We've obtained the control of the properties, or they have, um, that now, you know, working with our kid house to make it happen and support it. And just before we, just while we're on the subject of the camping, um, just for anybody who happens to be listening, um, I did get a phone call and someone thought that what's currently on Samoa Boulevard right now is our camping program. And I just wanna be really clear that that's not our camping program yet. Um, it will be inside of that metal building and that whole front area will be cleaned up. So what you're seeing right now is not the city of Arcata's solution. Um, so for F, um, that's kind of a big one. So any, I mean, we, if you look at it in the way that um, we're working with Cooperation Humboldt, then we kind of, we already are doing somewhat of that, but what are your thoughts on F? Yeah, I think just leaving it with the disclaimer that it is long-term, like like it is, um, you know, just to keep that in our in our minds and as kind of guiding principles. I mean, these are all, you know, supports that we want to see in this community when we have the funding, when we have the programs. Um, and so, you know, it's just seeing that as a, as a long-term and already getting that start with Cooperation Humble and also the outreach that Cooperation Humble has been doing. Um, and even maybe adding to that, you know, con continuing outreach. I know, I think we have missed on another section, but, you know, continuing that outreach, working with MIST, working with APD, um, you know, to be able to create systems that, again, work with the county to provide services to people. Um, so, yeah. And that's also where, like, our contract with, our MOU with CUNA comes in as well, mm -hmm. doing outreach. And, you know, they have that grant that we should hear about by April. So just, yeah, continuing to support CUNA as well moving forward. Okay, great. So let's, uh, speaking of CUNA, that leads us into number two for Valley West improvements. Um, and both A and B um, do seem to tie in with our relationship with CUNA. They are taking on a lot of that um, aspect. So if we just want to maybe glance through what's happening, and I mean, I just think we, in this whole category, I think everything is kind of, I don't have anything crossed off on my list from after my discussion with Karen, it seems to all be things that are currently happening and are reflective in the different staff um, wish lists of goals that we got. So um, I, my recommendation is to leave number two, leave everything in there. I don't know what else you guys have. Can I ask a, I wanna ask a question about B because, um... I know it still includes their support, the HSU student project to complete initial visioning. Um, I mean, have we had any more, you know, feedback with that group, work with that group? Has it kind of, did they, did they finish it? Do we have kind of a plan in place and just need funding for that? What is the status of that? Um, those students graduated, uh, hopefully with high honors from the good work that they did. <laughs> uh, but the plan is done uh, in terms of their planning process, right? And it was very base level planning. Uh, and so we have really worked with CUNA, and then we have a new Lead for America uh, fellow, Cerrojeo, who's also working in the Valley West area, and um, just starting to identify what would that ultimate property. I mean, I think there's kind of an interest in Laurel Tree, so we're working with them to see they'll have at least one more school year, maybe two, but they are under construction right now for their new site, which would be their permanent site. Um, as one space for that. So, I mean, I think part of the question is, do we sort of hold out for that potential space and start to work with that property owner? Um, so the school, the HSU classwork is done, but the CUNA contract and our Lead for America fellow are continuing to work on the development of community space out there. And part of that is that hoping to get the business improvement district up and running there, kind of the mini main street out there and start to engage in that business uh, community and trying to find support and space for that as well. Yeah, and I'd really like to stress the importance of uh, public safety and not just beautification, but some of the things um, that have been 
the have been missing in Valley West for a while, like um, additional trash cans and lighting to replace the lighting that has been out, you know, repainting of curbs if necessary, but um, just some important, you know, infrastructure as far as lighting and safety that's that's been kind of absent out there for a while, especially with, you know, a project home key. I'd just like to get more lighting and trash cans and more presence out there. And I mean, it, we, we do keep talking about trash cans, you know, and it just seems kind of ridiculous because they're just trash cans. And I realize that there's a lot more to it than that. But, you know, to the public, it also is very ridiculous that we just keep talking about trash cans. So if we could find a way to make that. Oh, OK, <laughs> go for it. Please, Emily, how is this going to happen? No, I just wanted to pick up from um, what Councilmember Matthews you know, was saying. And as part of Cooperation Humboldt's current contract, um, Kuna has been engaging community members for how best to spend the 15,000 that the council prioritized in this fiscal year's budget. So um, they've been having brainstorming sessions um, online um, with community members and with more community conversations and um, city staff are now going to be working with them in the next couple weeks to really come up with some cost estimates for some of the emerging priorities. And so some of those are, are definitely trash cans um, and many other um, you know, infrastructure improvements, but also you know, art and events. Um, so things that the uh, city staff um, and council members have heard from community members you know, in the last couple of years, but really appreciated Cooperation Humboldt's you know, focus on this um, participatory budgeting process um, that we look forward to then sharing with you kind of the communities um, kind of voting on priorities um, in hopefully in April. Yeah, and I also, you know, I'm really heartened to hear that there are um, grants pending for um, Carlson Park. You know, I read um, Aaron Ostrom's report from the last um, pack out cleanup, and it seems like it's kind of getting to be catastrophic out there. So I'm really hoping that we'll get some grants and be able to do some serious work out there. Thank you for the work with Kuna. It's, it's going to be great to get some of that um, accomplished, and we don't, <laughs> it'll be so exciting to have trash cans. <laughs> um, anything else for this particular category? So, um, moving on to mental health and social services. Um, let's see. So, um, we have A, hiring more um, social workers, mental health professionals to expand and um, access the services for MIST and more. Um, we have housing. No, that can't possibly be in this part. Oh, and then establish a working group of mental health or social service professionals. So um, just my thoughts on the, the first two of these. So um, first of all, for the, the missed workers, I know that there, we've, there's just been some staffing issues, which has been part of the problem. Um, I do want to, I do think because of their access to the county database, it's, I think it's a good fit. However, um, one thing that I've been asking for is, to have more consistency and have data collection. Um, I, you know, and then I know that there's been some problems with that. And I just, for me, in order, I do support this and I, I would like to see more of it because I think we, um, that's been part of the problem. We just haven't had the staffing. But in order to have more, I would definitely like to know um, what they're doing on a day to a day, you know, day to day basis, so that when we, um, you know, maybe quarterly or whatever, we can get a report. Because right now we've been pretty blind to whatever's happening. Um, that will be my same ask when we get to community ambassador. I definitely want, you know, metrics on that as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Especially, you know, when we are funding programs, it's good to know, you know, the work that they are doing and tangibly see it. You know, we might. I don't think we see all of the work that these various groups do for us in our community a lot of the time um, because, you know, it either goes under the radar or it's, you know, happening in people's lives that we don't directly know or see every day. So um, 
I, I, I like that idea of being able to have, yeah, like a quarterly report of, you know, this is who we've, in, we've engaged with this many people. This is, you know, the areas that we've focused on. We've, you know, met people in these encampments or struggling with these issues um, and kind of start to understand because having, yeah, programs that are data-driven are a lot more successful um, across the board. So I agree with that definitely to add something about, yeah, like a quarterly update or whatnot. That, that sounds great, Stacey, yeah. Just because we're in the process of changing funding sources around NIST, um, I thought Jen could give you a quick yeah. update on that. I actually can give you a quick update on that because I thought you might want it. So since their inception, which I think was in March of 21, they've assisted 70 homeless people with the funding that they've received so far. We had one quarter that was kind of a dip and there was only six, but we are getting quarterly reports. It's not as detailed, I think, as by what area, but it does give us the number of homeless people that they assist on their calls. And we did just meet with them recently and it does look like their staffing is, they can maybe maintain the staffing levels that we currently are at, but they don't have additional staff to give us at this time. So what I think Andrea and I have kind of discussed is maintaining the current staffing levels and the current um, funding and then re-evaluating when and if they're able to hire additional staff because they are having a, a difficult time staffing like everyone. So, so yeah, that's kind of the report that I have at this point. Well, and then, and maybe since you're more connected to it, if, if we could just find out a way to like give us some type of a regular update on, you know, what's happening, then that would make us more in the loop. So for the funding source, the CV1 funding source that actually expires in April, so I'll probably get one more report from them and that would be the last report, but I'd be happy to bring you back a compilation of all of the reports that we've received and kind of give you what that year looked like um, and see if I can get how moving forward with our new contract. Yeah, I was just thinking like moving forward, like, I mean, you know, it's fine to get the general update now, but I just think what we're looking forward for is if we're going to move forward, just some type of a regular update. Yeah, and we can look at that too, because the report that they're filling out currently is based on the CDBG CV funding. So if there's additional detail that you want in that report, it'd be great to know that so that we can put that into the contract. So we should discuss that more. Can figure out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for the, um, for item B, I mean, if you, you know, if you read the kind of what, you know, staff, it hasn't been initi initiated and, um, just from the staff report on that part, basically I think that we were shooting for the moon on this one and they're kind of bringing us back down to reality of well, this is kind of maybe too big for the city of Arcata. Um, so my, I mean, I think we, we, have, we have a lot of working groups and we have groups that we attend. So I feel like instead of trying to establish like our own group of mental health workers to just to continue to look for opportunities to collaborate with those, like with the county and other jurisdictions, you know, in, for ways to increase our efforts rather than trying to reinvent it on our own. That's just my suggestion. So I wouldn't cross it off, but I would say I would change it. So instead of establishing it, that look for opportunities to collaborate with other jurisdictions to increase mental health services. That sounds great, Stacey. No, it sounds good to me and I'd very much like to uh, help in any way that I can. Um, is there anything that we want to add to this category? Okay. I mean, the good part of us being such overachievers last year is we have this wonderful list that we can continue to work on. <laughs> um, okay, so going into infrastructure. Um, there, I didn't have anything crossed off as being completed. So in my mind, everything stays on there. Um, for B, what uh, my suggestion is because I think that we should continue to support the Plaza Improvement Task Force recommendations. We did um, achieve one part of that. So essentially we did cross that off our list, but um, rather than being done, my suggestion is that we 
um, look into adding the two, the expansion of the two one-way streets that are in that, um, I think continuing down 8th and 9th, just two more blocks, which would make those streets one way and provide more parking. Um, and we have definitely heard from the community that parking is a concern. Um, so that's my, um, that's the only suggestion I have for this particular category. Oh, except for, um, I did want to add E, um, to put the community ambassador program in there as, as for infrastructure, because it's already funded. And I didn't know, um, are you thinking the same thing? Okay. Well, that was my question was, you know, how can we envelop that into the Plaza Improvement Task Force too and take the feedback from, you know, those, those ideas that were generated from Plaza Improvement and, you know, have that um, inform the community ambassador program as well. Um, and that was my question was, should that go under infrastructure or should it go under economic recovery or is there a safety section? I don't know, but um, yeah, like where does that fall in? But I want to see that on here as well. And I did uh, bounce back and forth between those two. And I just landed on infrastructure. So I thought that's where you put it. But um, yeah, no, I um, think so. I, I agree with that. Um, yes, yeah, so on item A, um, it's something that I've been working on for several years uh, with HSU. And I, you know, I'd like to continue to, to work on those things and um, continue to get updates on that if the council is okay with that. No, absolutely. Yeah, and, and this could maybe go somewhere else too, but just thinking about that infrastructure and all of the building that uh, Cal Poly Humboldt is doing and just maybe, you know, I, I sat in on the HSU liaison meeting uh, this last month and like, I was like blown away by all these things. I didn't even know like were happening. And so for all of us, I think to get those updates, um, you know, quarterly or I guess, I don't know, we should maybe report those out at council meetings too, but um, just so we're all on the same page of knowing, you know, what Cal Poly Humboldt is doing, what we are doing, how those intersect um, and, and, you know, what successes are taking place too, to really see that they're engaging the community and engaging us, um, I think is important. So um, just kind of maybe adding that to, to A and, you know, working on developing that infrastructure and also having regular updates on it, I think is um, great for all of us, so. And I, I, oh, sorry, I did um, at that meeting, I had Karen help me take notes, you know, what would be appropriate to come back and share with the public. So tomorrow I will report out on that quarterly meeting. And I just want to, and one thing we talked about was just also just working with Cal Poly Humboldt to, um, you know, since we, we are in collaboration with them and we do have these meetings, but sometimes the public isn't aware of that. So to really come forth and figure out a way, you know, whether it's a press release or something to just show that we're working together and what we're working on. I think that would be important for morale, especially for all of these changes. That's great. Okay, so anything else for infrastructure? Okay, so moving. Yeah, okay. I mean, I. Oh, I was just going to say, um, where is the wastewater treatment plant listed? It... Okay. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's definitely not in our list, but it is in the capital improvements list. Yeah, but that's a great point, Brett. Thanks. Um, yeah, what does the staff feel about that? Does that make sense to to add under infrastructure, or do you want to keep it somewhere else? Or like, could we say an in infrastructure, you know, support the city's capital improvement projects, you know, which that is at like the top of the list for upcoming, I guess. I think it was on the council's priority projects for several years, just kind of the impetus behind getting it, the ball rolling. Um, and really that horse is way out of the gate, but so I think that's when it was removed from this list, recognizing that it was just going to be moving forward. It's it's funded. It's at design level. It's but go ahead, Nitro. Oh no, I was going to say uh, item four infrastructure. You know, the whole CIP list can go under that because, <laughs> and, and we can give you an so add this list to it, Karen. <laughs> so that is the infrastructure projects. That is the infrastructure project that we are working on. As you see, there's a list of projects, and then we can give you an update on this at the end of the meeting or now, if you wish. I mean, I think if we just put CIP projects under that, I don't, yeah, keep it simple. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I pretty much feel when we get these lists, there, we, we, we kind of have to say yes to most of it. So, um, <laughs> just add it to there. 
Was that just, was that the only question, the wastewater? Okay. Yeah, I mean, are there other, um, I, I haven't looked, uh, taken the detailed look at the CIP list, but um, are there other infrastructure concerns that we should be considering under, in that list, under that category? Yeah. <laughs> I was not sure if that was a question. Well, there are a lot of projects. In a given year, uh, we do annual projects like uh, street paving. That always happens. That's part of the CIP project. Annual sidewalk project, annual maintenance projects, water line project, uh, sewer line project, wastewater treatment plant project has been on the books for more than five years, and it will remain on the books for, I would say, five more years until we are done with the project. So, yes, yeah, so there are a lot of critical projects we are constantly working on and also constantly applying for grants. So, uh, especially for CIP, now David has taken a lead role. Uh, as of last year, we were working on only one year CIP project, but moving forward, we will have a five year CIP project so we can plan and foresee and fund the projects. And also, as we know, there's a big, uh, potentially there's a big flow of money coming. So we are getting ready for the projects so we can project ready and we can apply for those fundings. Um, just because we're on the subject of infrastructure, what are the uh, facility upgrades for the community center? Um, sure, I'd be happy to um, speak to that. Um, that is a was an ongoing um, CIP project, um, kind of approved from previous years, but for this in particular, it is really on the CIP list to reflect um, the prioritization of ARPA allocations for energy upgrades, potential fuel switching, and really a demonstration um, site for um, uh, really of climate change adaptation um, and more energy efficiency. And so um, Environmental Services has been working on, um, you know, looking at what options could be and working with Redwood Coast Energy Authority on that. Um, and Deputy Director Emily Benzi has been leading that effort. And just to add one more thing, I guess it's more of a question about the structure of this list. It's a, a priority project. So it doesn't, I know for my department, it doesn't list out everything that we're doing. Um, so these are just sort of like the icing on the cake that the council wants to make sure that we budget around. So I think there's probably going to be a lot of things, that, you know, in here that are not necessarily listed out. So uh, I think that, I think that's what it was. Yeah. Well, that's the way I interpreted it too. Just looking because, you know, I went through what our list was and it's like, oh, and now there's all of your lists. And I was like, oh boy. Um, but, you know, as just from looking at them, it kind of seems like, you know, you all kept what our general goals were in mind when you were putting here. So it's, it all, I feel like it all really flows nicely together. And again, we're just, we're big picture and you guys know what, what the day-to-day -day operations and what needs to happen. And so I'm just, you know, so that's the way I'm looking at it as well. I mean, I think kind of like we're just going to put CIP projects under here. Um, it would make sense, you know, if it was just like David's list. Um, and then that list existed somewhere of all those projects. Yeah, so that list becomes adopted as part of your budget and it will be, it's in your budget book and it's, um, and so if we put it as, you know, support the annuals capital improvement program on here, uh, it just kind of highlights, well, I should go looking for that. What is that program? And then they can reference that in the budget as well. So what you're saying is that like, we'll see all these ideas reflected line item pretty much in the budget and then we can really take a close, you know, yeah. That final look. Yeah. Okay. And just to add to, I mean, like, yeah, this is our our fun with some things we want, but like these are things that have to get done to make make the city keep going and then not deteriorate and crumble into nothing. So we got to do it. <laughs> I think wastewater isn't glamorous. Remove C on infrastructure because that paving overlay should be done, right? That's right. what they're working on. Okay. So we do we can. It's in progress, so we'll we can cross it off. Oh, C, not D. Yeah, it's um, in construction right now. Um, we are hoping it'll be done by before June 30 this year. Okay, so for um, economic recovery strategies, just my overview. Um, so for B, um, I have that we could we could mark that off because we do already have the ARPA money set aside and the procedures are already set and in place. So the program's basically in place until the money's gone or maybe until it times out and probably one or the other. So um, that's already all taken care of. I did have a question. <clears throat> 
Brett, for you, because you did, um, I know the Economic Recovery Collaborative with Main Street and the Chamber and Cal Poly Humboldt, um, that w kind of ties in with D, both of those do, and I know that was one of, you know, one of your creations, and so I just wanted to check in with you and see if you had any feedback for, in, that, in this category. Um, it seems like people in the group still feel like the meetings are useful and they, um, there's just some uh, consensus, I think, that moving them to once a month instead of twice a month um, would be more efficient. Um, so right now that's my understanding is we're working on a new meeting time and uh, just having a meeting once a month. Um, I think, you know, it, in the beginning of COVID, uh, when there was a lot more going on, um, you know, a lot more brainstorming and, and creativity was needed and made sense to have more frequent meetings. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I know so far. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add too that, um, you know, that group is really supporting a lot of the things that we're talking about. Like that group is really excited about, you know, improving the HSU corridor. They're really excited about the community ambassador program, um, you know, and various stuff that we've been talking about lately. And it is a good chance to, to get those updates of what the business community is feeling. I know that, you know, you get that from Main Street, you get that from the chamber. So it's nice that all of us kind of have our, our little in to, to get those updates too. Um, so I, I fairly knew that I've been on that uh, committee, but I, I like it. I've been enjoying it. Um, and, but yeah, I think, yeah, the monthly meetings, it was just starting to feel twice, twice a month was starting to feel overwhelming for folks and just people's schedules getting busy, especially around springtime too. So um, I think once a month will be effective still. Yeah. I miss attending those meetings. Those were fun. I would just like to, um, you know, we really focus, it seems, on Main Street a lot. It would be really, I know there's so many empty storefronts, like in Westwood Market and in Valley West and like so many other areas. It would be really great to promote, you know, having new businesses come in and kind of looking a little bit outward into some of the other places in Arcata. And, and since it made me, you jogged my memory when you brought up Main Street, because I know this is going to naturally lead into budget, and my um, uh, my recommendation would be that we, um, if we are able to, that we take Main Street's budget up to what it was in the past, because they really have been working hard. It's a really small group, but they've been working hard to rebuild, and um, it, it, things are, um, you know, are are going smooth. And so I think it would be great if we could, it's a really important organization for us to have. And we just, we do need to figure out how we can boost it and, and, and help um, support it. So. Yeah. Especially since they haven't really been able to build up their budget in the last couple of years. And so I completely support that they've been doing just incredible job, even through COVID really promoting businesses. And I just, Huge kudos to Main Street. Yeah, and I was just going to add, too, off of what you were just saying, Meredith. Um, you know, it, Shoshana's kind of started that a little bit, seeing, you know, going out to Valley West with the um, the, the Christmas stuff and everything like that and you know, into the Sunnybury Center. And so starting to see, you know, if anybody hasn't been to Brainwash Thrift and the Sunnybury Center, they're blowing it up over there, and it's awesome. And there's super cool artwork and great stuff and her new space is going to be awesome. Um, but yeah, seeing these in our little neighborhoods, I think is really cool. And, you know, making sure and working with main street to prioritize, you know, businesses outside of Plaza too, like we're seeing, you know, as one of our goals for creating a similar thing for Valley West, um, and, you know, promoting these other little neighborhood centers we have too, um, I think is really valuable. And I know the chamber is really focused on that as well and seeing what we can do. So yeah, I just want to say I appreciate you giving me uh, credit for creating it. But, um, you know, I'd really say it was more uh, a creation that, um, you know, Karen helped bring to life. Um, it was just kind of an idea I had. And, uh, you know, she did a lot of the heavy lifting to make it a reality. She is very good at helping us to look good. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay, so is it okay to move into infill and redevelopment? Um, so on this one, I mean, there's only two things on it, which is probably good, um, but just obviously housing, right? We know we need more housing. Um, and then it's about completing the K Street corridor and the gateway plan and the general plan. So, um, yeah, what, um, I mean, obviously, yes to all of this, but um, what else? 
Yeah, I, I think just maybe adding a little bit of language, I kind of wrote a little bit of something, but um, especially like the the public comment that public comments that we heard tonight and you know the experience I think we've all been having um, surrounding public engagement around the gateway plan. So just you know, I think in our goals, making sure to include that we want to, you know, continue public outreach and engagement um, around infill, the gateway draft plan and general plan updates, um, and then provide the public with opportunities to engage with these plans and create a land use code that reflects the wants and needs of our community while meeting regional housing and transit goals, focusing on walkability, pedestrian and bike safety, varied and affordable housing options and mixed use communities. Um, and so, you know, just kind of refining some of that language a bit to, to include the idea of, you know, engaging with the public and creating something that, you know, is really community driven and community backed. Um, and that, you know, that idea that, you know, I, that we've been talking about that, you know, we can create a code that really, you know, points development in the right way and says, this is what we as a community want. The developers know already, people coming in building know already, you know, this is what we're looking for. And so, um, yeah, I think I will say, though, that um, I do appreciate all the outreach that staff has been doing, you know, since I've been on the council, I have seen, you know, many, many opportunities that you have created for walking tours, for meetings in a box, for, you know, open you know, open houses from being at the farmer's market. So I, I really do see that we're trying to engage the public and I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. If I could just speak to that for just a moment. Um, I really appreciate the suggested addition um, in your priority projects. And it's definitely our primary goal from the department's perspective uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the, set, the memo that you received um, for, for recommendations for us. I've been really uh, privileged and proud of the work, privileged to work with and proud of the work that, you know, my team's been doing to, to um, you know, engage on this and, and many other topics. So we see that as a key priority as well. And, and you know, to the commenters who spoke today, we, we want to make sure that they continue to have access and, and opportunity to, um, you know, to weigh in on these plans before the, the council uh, is making decisions. So, so I think that's a, a great addition uh, to the priority projects. So I just capture that in your notes as Sarah will send me some language. Is that <laughs> I'll give you my paper after the meeting. Yeah. She's a little something she threw together. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just want to clarify. So, cause I think that was the direction we gave last year. We are making a specific plan, right? So there seems to be some confusion with an area plan. Yeah. That, that's okay. actually holdover language from previously. And that should uh, reflect accurately as a, as a gateway area plan as opposed so when, to when did we make that change from a specific plan to an area plan? Um, it, it was a, I, I'd have to research to, to give you this, the uh, exact date when we talked about it, but essentially the conversation was around the um, requirements for developing a specific plan. A specific plan is a very, uh, has a, a, a very specific definition that's called out in uh, planning law. Um, and it has a special relationship to the CIP that's related to that specific plan. Specific plans are typically done for shorter durations, smaller uh, uh, projects where you know that you can define the project scope for all of the infrastructure that's needed to support that specific plan. Um, and you have you know, the CIP that identifies all of the expenditures that will go into creating that specific plan. Um, whereas a community area plan, this is more like a community area plan, it is a little bit more broad and a little bit more general. It, it, it doesn't even ensure that, you know, all of the development that's planned for within it will occur. It just says that it can occur. And so it's, it lines out, it maps out a, a, a pathway for accomplishing certain goals as opposed to committing to specifically actioning those, those goals. Um, so, so when, you know, when we originally started talking about the, the planning process, you know, we talked about these different um, uh, plan types and, you know, essentially as we got closer to engaging in the process, uh, we, we established that, you know, the community area plan was, was a better approach for what we were trying to accomplish with this, uh, uh, this particular plan. So I'd have to research the specific date, but that was a, a, a conversation that we had at the council level. Okay. Um, yeah, I've just heard a lot uh, from people in the community. They really feel like the the specific plan is really what's in the best interest of the community. Um, and it seems like, you know, it 
gives a lot more flexibility. Um, this is just a, a better way to go. So I'm just, you know, wondering if we could have the planning commission kind of, you know, mull that over. What what would be better, specific plan or an area plan? Yeah, I'd be happy to have a, a conversation with the planning commission about it. Cool. Um, the, then, the specific plan is actually a lot more restrictive. It's not more flexible. It's more restrictive. Um, and it, it ties the city to producing uh, infrastructure over a period of time, and it ties specifically to the capital improvement program within that. Um, so then when, you know, so essentially the city would be, you know, committing to deliver on those capital improvements. The way that it's structured now, although we haven't, you know, we don't have the, the zoning piece of the gateway plan yet to look at. So there's a lot of detail that's left out of it at this point. Uh, but if we do um, commit to a specific plan, then, you know, essentially those those time frames are limited. If you don't accomplish the specific plan, then the, um, you know, the streamlining that's associated with it goes away. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I think that the, you know, the community plan, it gives us more flexibility than than the specific plan would. So that that will you know be my recommendation ultimately when we review those. But we can go over it again. Yeah, I definitely like to um, hear the planning commission's thoughts on that. Um, it's something I've been hearing, you know, echoed a lot by some members of the com community that are involved in the the gateway planning. Um, and also, uh, you know, I feel like it would make a lot of sense to separate the gateway plan it kind of as a standalone from the general plan. Um, it seems like it would make more sense to finish the general plan first um, and then do the gateway plan as its own standalone plan. And I think that that would also, you know, I know there's concerns um, whether or not uh, the mayor, you know, may or may not be able to be involved with it. And if it's part of the general plan, then it would, then, you know, you might not be able to take part in the general plan, which I think would be a tragedy. But if we're able to separate it, then, you know, that might be a benefit is that uh, you'd be able to participate in the general plan. Um, so those are my thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I don't think those two things are necessarily directly connected. Um, I think that regardless of uh, the, you know, if the if there's a specific, um, uh, you know, uh, if 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 there is determined that there's a conflict of interest uh, with mayor on the gateway area plan, she can still participate in the broader general plan, and ultimately whether it's a Call the specific plan. We actually go through the the planning process as laid out in planning law to adopt a specific plan, whether it's a community area plan, and we go through that process um, or some other. All of that ultimately will be embedded in the general plan because um, that's that's the location for that level of document. Um, and you know, certainly, if the council wants us to, you know, speed up, slow down, stop, that's your discretion. Um, you know, we're acting on prior council direction. Uh, we do have a number of grants um, that, um, you know, are paying for this work uh, that have, you know, commitments that go through 22, uh, which is why we've lined up the, the schedule to go through 22. Um, and I do, I do feel for the people who, you know, feel like, well, they didn't hear about the plan, uh, you know, previously, or that they feel like this is a top down approach. This is a very uh, organic bottom up approach that we spent. Uh, you know, hundreds of hours developing uh, through many different uh, community engagements dating back to uh, in earnest 2019. So, uh, but we, we, you know, certainly the council can, uh, you know, take a look at that. We'll, I think we're going to be bringing some of the updates to our uh, gateway area planning process to the council at a, a council meeting soon. And so that may be an appropriate time to uh, discuss further uh, you know, whether you want us to disconnect those or, you know, how you want to go about that once you have the information available to you about what the repercussions of taking those decisions would be. Great. Um, yeah. And I also want to make sure we, um, you know, I don't know, pay attention to the relationship between the goal of uh, upgrading the wastewater treatment plant and the planning for this project, because it does seem like from the information that I've been provided by staff that we can actually identify you know, pretty closely how many connections we can add to our system. And I just want to make sure we're not over planning because, um, you know, it might make sense to base the project around how many connections we can add. Yeah, the, the general plan update is going to plan for a, you know, 20 year growth period. Um, it's my expectation that in that environmental review, we will identify a new uh, goal for wastewater treatment that will involve adding new infrastructure 
I can't tell you exactly what that would be right now, but you know there is going to be additional upgrades that we won't be relying on the infrastructure that we have in place today to service for the next 20 years. And I would defer to uh, Nature on, on that as, as well as Emily. Yeah, and if that's warranted, that we'll plan for that. It's new. So isn't it a 50 year plan right now? Which plan? The, the wastewater water treatment water? plan. Yeah. The plan is for 30 years. For 30 years? 30 years yeah. Okay. But that's not necessarily 30 years of build out. That's 30 years of value in the infrastructure we're placing in. That's the lifespan of the equipment that we're putting in, right? Okay. We expect it to last for 30 years. Okay. And we'll stretch that as we have the current infrastructure that some of it's been in there for 50 or 60 years. So 30 is a conservative number with our history here, but at least 30 years we would get out of this investment. Okay. And so the, <clears throat> so just take a step further, just to summarize what, I, what I'm hearing is, so even though, um, you know, it's a 30 year plan, it doesn't mean that we can't upgrade or expand or whatever within that time, which um, is really important for the, public to hear there's probably a collective sigh of relief um because yeah, i think I don't that think there is anywhere to expand it to or to move it to i think that's part of the problem why we have to you know really take it seriously i guess and really make sure we're um paying attention to the details because in the past that's been the information brought to us by the staff it's it's going to be maxed out um, i wouldn't say it will max out there are ways uh, the technology is in place that we could have a smaller wastewater plant in the footprint that we have right now as you have seen the pre-design report there was a plan to build oxidation ditch in phase two oxidation ditch two which can faster in a smaller space treat the wastewater so there is room to do that it's not that but also just so that you know uh, currently we are working with uh, our one of our uh, funding agency srf uh, from the state they are helping us to do a technical study which will be bringing to the council maybe in a year or two the that report will tell us what is the capacity of the plant is and what you how the city should plan for future improvements uh, along in uh, in future i guess okay so will that be done before we finalize the gateway plan no. Okay. So we're going to do the gateway plan, and after that, we're going to figure out um, how much wastewater we can wastewater service we can provide. But um, I don't think this this study is going to hold gateway plan. Gateway plan can move the way it is right now. It's not going to hold. But we don't know how many connections we can. But we know we can it's not provide that. Spring up overnight. It's not going to spring up overnight either. Once we approve a land use code, it's not like we're going to have thirty thousand more people living in Arcata. Um, you know, within the next even five years, you know, if, if that's overnight, I mean, in the time that we can analyze wastewater and decide what improvements or expansions need to take place. I mean, I think, you know, again, approving a, a land use code doesn't necessarily equate with direct development. Yeah, I also think we're talking about the size of the project, right? Like if it's eight stories, four stories. Um, we've actually put numbers on how many people might live there, like 7,000 has been a number that's been thrown around. So, you know, that's that's just what I'm getting at. Like, I feel like we can actually identify a number and then plan for that. Um, and we shouldn't, you know, we can't just say, well, we're going to, the technology of the future is going to solve this problem for us. I mean, look at, you know, what's, what that's done for the environment. I mean, it's, it hasn't really panned out. So we just really need to make sure we have, you know, ironclad numbers, like we have engineer supported data showing what we're going to be able to provide. Um, I don't think it's responsible to move forward with something and say, okay, we're going to figure out the wastewater later. It's such a major you know, element of the project. The, um, the environmental impact report that we're doing on the gateway plan will identify that. And so I think the report that nature is talking about is a different report. It's not even, it's not, they're not related. Um, and so we will have an environmental impact report that will identify, uh, you know, targets and thresholds for all of our infrastructure. Uh, and, um, you know, and when that infrastructure needs to go into place, uh, into service in order to meet those growth projections. So, it, you know, where and how, you know, we'll have options, you know, and, and we'll evaluate that in the EIR, what those options are. Yeah. And just to kind of, I mean, sum up what you were saying before too, David, is just, 
I think it would be really helpful, you know, either next time um, Gateway updates are brought before us or maybe even having a study session again with um, the Planning Commission about it, um, just to kind of, because I definitely would want more understanding and information about, yeah, the difference between a specific plan and an area plan and how that, you know, affects our planning and how it aligns the general plan and the coastal plan and everything like that um, to be able to have, you know, a dedicated meeting to, yeah, sit down and talk about that, yeah, with the Planning Commission, um, with all of us, with you and your uh, department and everybody involved. Um, I think, you know, we're having, <laughs> I, I, somehow this meeting has turned into a gateway meeting, no. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, this is something that all of us want to discuss more in the future and, and get more, yeah, hard information, hard facts, understand, because a lot of it is kind of ethereal right now. So, um, yeah, I think that would be helpful in the future, just putting that seat out there. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think, yeah, I think it's really well said. Thank you. Well, and from what I'm hearing, it sounds like, you know, staff is very confident, like it's not so out there for them. They have that knowledge. So it just has to get to us and to the, you know, and the rest of the community so we can all be on the same page. Just really quickly before we move on, um, I just want to make sure that um, to Sarah's point, um, talking about uh, the K Street corridor and pedestrian and bike safety, that um, maybe this is not the correct place to have it, but it definitely needs to be in a future goal talking about um, transportation and pedestrian bike safety. Yeah, I, I do want to add, and I don't know, or I guess we have 10 as transit, so we'll, we'll get there, but looking at um, you know, we got some communication about the regional transportation plan, um, and just, you know, getting perhaps cause that, that's recently, um, ad adopted. And so, you know, getting a report from HCOG, having the transportation safety committee give feedback on that and kind of working to implement some of those goals as well, because a, they help with transit and our alternative transit transportation systems, but also, you know, going towards our climate goals. Um, so I think that'll be important um, to look at that as well. Yeah, I think we're all on the same page about that. So I know we got that email from Colin Fisk as well with some requests for goals, but I don't have that list in front of me. Was some of that transit? Yeah. Well, yeah. And so that's kind of, I, okay. yeah, I have two points on my little list here that kind of, I really tried to, you know, summarize down, but you know, all the stuff he sent out sounded really great. I just need, I think, more information about the regional transportation plan and, you know, what HCOG is doing with that. And then also, I guess I, I as RCA, I know a bit about the, um, the CAPE plan, the Repower Humboldt plan as well, but kind of, you know, how can we as a council help support and implement those goals? Um, and then also, you know, he touched on the importance and I think, um, we should add it to this list if maybe we, you know, we have the all electric initiative, maybe even creating just like a, a climate section um, and thinking about completing and adopting um, and implementing a climate action plan, the, the regional cap as well. Um, so I think kind of all of those things go together and they really fit um, with kind of our, the objectives on this objective list, especially three and four, promoting energy efficient, for, uh, pedestrian friendly transportation, mm -hmm. emphasizing um, different alternative modes of transportation, uh, pedestrian bicycle, and then also promoting efficient energy use and renewable energy in buildings. We see that on our capital improvements list. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, being able to kind of encapsulate all that into, you know, a, a climate change goal, I guess. Well, just to illustrate that we are all on the same page, um, I uh, I do, I have proposed um, a climate change category and I did add safety to the transit because I think, you know, we've all been sharing these ideas on the dais. And so, um, yeah, so that I, I think we can, I think we're, we're, all, we're all there on the same page, so that's good. Did staff get that email from Colin Fisk? Okay, great. Yeah, and I um, when we um, get to that one, I did because um, it was a lot, you know. I mean, yeah, it, was a lot. it was very specific because he, you know he's an expert in that area, um, and so I did work with Karen to try to like encapsulate it into a couple ideas. So I'm guessing it was probably some synergy in what we came up with. Okay, so um, I think seven is going to be easy. Um, implement the Arcata Art Strategic Plan by working with existing artists arts efforts established in the community. So that was completed and adopted and we just, um, it, well, it's, it's already implemented. So is this a, is this a cross it off? Or, I mean, we're gonna continue to do it. 
Yeah, we're going to keep, yeah, we're definitely going to keep doing it. It's new and we've got lots of work. Emily certainly could speak to it. I think, you know, the idea is what makes your priority list. And I mean, my recommendation is that you could remove this. It's in motion at this point, but Emily. Yeah, I just really wanted to give an update um, on how um, community development and environmental services staff are working towards creating or updating the arts around town guidelines um, for public, you know, opportunities to propose public art projects that are consistent um, with the Arcata Arts Strategic Plan. Um, and we are uh, currently doing um, those updates with a plan to bring um, some proposals to our proposed process to the Parks and Rec Committee in uh, March. So in about two weeks, um, the Parks and Rec Committee served um, kind of as a uh, as the committee that um, reviewed public art proposals and we're suggesting kind of a change um, to that. And so bringing that to them and really creating a, a process that um, can hopefully have more equity in mind for um, really enabling more public art proposals. And also just wanted to make the connection that we also hope to release um, a call for art that would be funded by your ARPA allocation um, geared towards um, art in the downtown area in particular, and hopefully in other um, areas of the city that have less public art as well. So just wanted to provide that update on implementation of ASAP. Well, um, and I'm very envious of the Eureka Street Art Fair. So, um, you know, <laughs> just wanna throw that out there. They do a great job, so, um, okay. So I guess I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's happening and it's going forward. So do we cross it off or do we keep it on? I think we sh should leave it on there. And I'd actually like to maybe see something added in there just about also collaborating um, with Cal Poly Humboldt on that too. Cause I know there's some things in the pipeline to have art on the walking bridge perhaps. And then also, um, you know, the, the movement that we made to have some sort of uh, mural memorializing Josiah Lawson as well. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the collaboration with artists at Cal Poly Humboldt um, is going to be important to, to accomplishing this and also engaging that community um, with our projects as well, so. Okay, so um, the last time we set goals, we just, we had zero waste. That was one of the goals, but from what I've, you know, been hearing from what everybody's been bringing forward at meetings, um, a, a more robust climate change measure category should go on there. That's what everybody's saying. So, um, Right, absolutely. So the some of the points that um, on this on this one. Sorry, my notes are getting a little. Um, I so I had um, keeping A as A as B thirteen eighty three. You know that's something that we need to work on. Um, and then I had. We could, for B, um, update the city's green fleet policy to um, include the uh, inc and include target goals, so make it a little more specific. So um, convert city's fleet uh, to zero emission vehicles. So that's a possibility to add in there. Um, and then the complete, so the, the cap complete, adopt and begin the implementation of the cap. And I think that was in, that was also in staff priorities as well. And that was in Collins as well, I, I think. Um, and then, and uh, Karen, I, you can have to refresh my memory on this, but we wrote down track ARPA funded climate change pro projects. And I just, I, I'm at a loss as to what, what yeah, so we, we gave you a quick update. Um, it's been about a month and a half ago, probably, on you had a climate change set aside. And so we brought a list of projects associated with that. So I just thought something in your goals around, you know, finalizing and monitor the, you know, ARPA fund set aside for climate change and emissions reductions locally or something like that as a priority project, since you will definitely be spending money on it this year and we'll be identifying those projects. So I, I just tried to make them like general because like the cap one is huge, I, I'm assuming. I mean, it seems big to do that. Um, and then the green fleet um, upgrade, you know, that making that more specific seemed like a really like a tarp, you know, something we could track. But um, is there are there things that were that were missing on there? 
Well, we also have like number 11 as a separate for all electric initiative, but that really goes. Oh, in with- no, that's supposed to be in there. That's my B. I'm sorry. That was supposed to be in there. Yeah. Cause, oh, okay. Yeah. Cause I, yeah. I wanted to move that into move there. Move it up. Yeah. yeah sorry. That's great. And I mean, do we have an, what can, I don't know. do we have an update on that right now? I mean, I know that we've, we're pretty far along and pretty close to having that come before us. Right. Um, and I know that also, um, during our CEA, uh, board meeting, Scott Bauer shared that Eureka is also hoping to begin that process as well. So maybe our, our energy committee could help them out. <laughs> but. Yeah. Um, we'd be happy. And also deputy director, Emily Benvy has been leading, um, the creation of a draft, um, ordinance for, um, electrification of new construction and can share progress. Good evening, council members. Um, yes, yeah, so we are moving forward in our natural gas ban ordinance. I'm trying to come up with softer language on that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been working with a number of jurisdictions in California to learn from what other municipalities have done. Um, have met with the city attorney a couple of times, and we're at the phase where we are um, vetting a draft ordinance at the staff level at which point we expect to bring that back to the subcommittee, the electrification subcommittee of the energy committee. From there, it will go to the energy committee um, and that will serve as as the first touchstone for the public process. And so we're still fleshing out what that public review process will look like. The whole- I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Would you please remind me, what are we talking about again? I'm sorry. (laughs) We're talking about the um, electrification ordinance. Thank you, I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, So the hope is that we'll have a draft ordinance before council prior to the end of this fiscal year, and then that will move into next fiscal year for finalization. And with electrification, that is not just the fleet. This is also like lawnmowers and all the, all. Sure. So I apologize. I'll take a step back. This electrification ordinance that um, I've been speaking to very specifically would be to prohibit new natural gas infrastructure associated with new construction. So that really focuses on new development. It doesn't target existing development. It doesn't speak to... Um, Equipment, which is supposed to be phased out in 2024, I believe, new gas for small for uh, small landscaping. Yep, small landscaping tools. equipment and tools, uh, 2024. And then the other piece of the the quote unquote electrification initiative, um, Director Sinkhorn spoke to earlier, which is surrounding the electrification and fuel switching, the electrification and efficiency upgrades to city facilities. Thank you, Emily. I'm sorry if I confused anybody. I did kind of switch us down to, to number 11 while we were still, I think, on number eight. So combining, yeah, layering them in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, Meredith, when we, um, I mean, I think Brett's more familiar with the electrification part because I can't, you know, they were working on it when he was on council and then it just, um, it was one of the very first things that got brought up to us when we were first on council, but it just wasn't quite ready to move forward. So that's why it's newer to you because we haven't really heard about it since then. All right, so I felt like I heard support and I actually think it's a really good idea to have a climate change and climate adaptation. We'll fix spelling later. Um, But so this is what I think I heard. I just want to see if we actually have consensus around that. So having the zero waste to implement of SB 1383 on organics, moving the all electric initiative, we'll add in some detail, um, finalize and adopt and implement the climate action plan. And then your ARPA funds associated with climate uh, change and adaptation implementation and then updating the city's green fleet policy with some specific goals around conversion to an electric, or I'll just say an emissions-free fleet. It's not, it won't necessarily all be electric. Um, it looks good to me. We just need to switch the I and the O. Yep. That one's just bugging you, huh? Yeah. Get that one right mm-hmm. now. <laughs> I'm sure there's gonna be. <laughs> It's like the, this is like a hybrid keyboard. It has to be replaced this year. It'll be in the budget. (laughs) I did want to share with the council, not, not suggesting that this should be another priority, um, but I feel like your, your list reflects a lot of the climate change adaptation strategies that the department has outlined in our goals. 
um, another just to uh, keep in the mix, not necessarily for prioritizing, but um, the, the department's focused on grant um, fund seeking for acquisitions that could be beneficial for sea level rise adaptation. So thinking in the you know, long term for what climate change impacts could be here in Arcata. Um, so that's something that has been ongoing and the council has um, kind of supported some of those efforts so far as well as um, grant funding to, you know, for other adaptation strategies and also to more better understand um, the dynamics of what sea level rise um, could impact uh, the city um, and really looking at what all those processes could be so we could have a more detailed understanding of, of how we can plan adaptation. And I think that's also really linked with community developments um, leading of the local coastal program update. I think that's a great, idea yeah. well yeah, and oh sorry well i was just going to say that uh land acquisition is under our new capital improvement projects for sea level adaptation so if we're supporting this list we got that on there too so yeah well and we're not if we're i i, I think it's i would feel comfortable to i mean I think that maybe we should, does everybody think we should add it to a priority? Because I just think it reflects our, even though we know what's in the works, it really, ref, it does reflect what our public wants. And obviously we're not gonna be able to do anything if we're underwater, so. There you go. You may, may wanna to add too, just because we are going through the local coastal program update right now as well, and has the sea level rise adaptation is a huge component of that. So maybe adding to this, and Emily was, we were on the same wavelength right there, we caught that exact same wave. Uh, to have maybe um, sea level rise adaptation planning and implementation, then it would incorporate things like seeking grant funds as well as do, you know adopting the documents and doing further studies for implementation. So, yeah, thank you for that. It's Im implementation. <laughs> That's gonna be, and we're, we're, we're just going to make fun of you for the rest of the meeting. No, as a teacher, I know I, I ignore all my students' spelling all the time. It's like I, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Okay, but I think this goal just got a little broader based on Emily and David's input. So it's more than just considering strategic properties. It really is considering measure, specific measures around sea level rise adaptation, planning and implementation, Which, including include considering strategic properties. Okay. Okay, so then um, for parks improvements, um, I don't have any changes to what we have on here. Um, I know that the parks department, they have a specific list and I don't know how that interfaces with what, what we've got on here. Uh, there's a couple additions on the TAP. Maybe you wanna go through those, Emily? Sure. Um, so for our current fiscal year priorities, um, we are hoping for Shea Park um, that uh, that work will be put out to bid this spring, and then construction will happen this summer. Um, and what is, what is that work? Pardon? What is that work? Um, the Shea Park Phase Two um, would be adding on to the um, great kind of basketball court. Um, and concrete area, adding a uh, fitness area for kind of older youth and adults, um, as well as kind of other amenities like um, table tennis, concrete table tennis tables or other uh, kind of interactive, um, but uh, uh, more like, um, you know, graffiti proof type of, um, you know, uh, amenities, um, and also kind of having more of a, a connection to the you know trail that's going by. And that's how we're gonna resolve all our differences in the future is table tennis. Cause I saw I saw a lot of people nodding. Oh yeah. So we're gonna be we're gonna be shooting three pointers and table tennis for all future decisions. So everybody start warming up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just for um, speaking to the other parks um, priorities, um, you know, I thought maybe this could be just a good time um, to give an update on um, the ES committees, Parks and Rec Committee, um, Wetlands and Creeks and Forest Management um, were involved in providing recommendations um, that would then inform um, the council's, um, especially budgeting for this next fiscal year for the open space um, and special uh, tax. Um, and that, um, 
that the committees were kind of worked in an ad hoc um, situation to recommend um, projects that would support that open space special tax in kind of different categories of um, stewardship and maintenance, um, enhancing public access and increasing uh, acquisitions um, of our you know, open space lands. Um, and that committee has made recommend recommendations um, that you will see reflected in the Parks and Rec um, and Wetlands and Creeks and Forest um, components of the department's goals. I just wanted to bring that up as we then uh, in the future head into um, budget uh, you know, setting for next fiscal year. Um, but on the park side, um, in particular, um, you know, that ad hoc group and the Parks and Rec Committee really wants to see the completion of improvements at Carlson Park, um, which I'd be happy to speak to more, um, as well as um, replacement of equipment at Bloomfield Park, neighborhood park. And so that is one of the new projects um, that is, has been added to, back into the CIP list. Um, and for Carlson Park, um, you know, the city has definitely uh, recognized um, that there's many challenges out in Carlson Park. Um, we've been really excited about the partnership with CUNA um, and the Playhouse and Main Street and others that have really put on events in the front part of Carlson Park that have been, have attracted, you know, dozens and hundreds of community members and CUNA continues to adopt that front part of Carlson Park. Um, the city has submitted, uh, has three uh, grant proposals um, in the works. Um, we have um, gotten some kind of soft indication that we may be recommended for one of those. Um, our hope is for this uh, next year to complete final designs and hopefully, you know, with all three funding sources, if not, then just with one, would then head into improvements um, at Carlson Park that would really help to shift current uses. Um, and we really feel that uh, that is kind of gonna be a way to really bring Carlson Park um, to be much more accessible to community members. In the meantime, um, we have you know been working with many partners for um, outreach and also have a CalRecycle solid waste abatement um, grant that we will be partnering soon to continue kind of solid waste abatement um, uh, uh, cleanup. So I've definitely eyes are on um, on that park in, in Valley West as a key priority. And um, I'm thinking since that, I mean, that Carlson Park has been a priority. It's been in the forefront for a while and it's actually not on this list. So maybe we should just put it on the list because, West, oh, it's on Valley West. Okay, yeah. as long as it's on there. Yeah, right, we have a, yeah, see, prioritize improvements to Carlson Park, picnic tables, bathrooms, cleanup. Yeah. Okay, and so um, I've, um, I know that transportation um, like safety particularly has been a big issue for, for all of us um, and for the community. And so for 10, um, I thought if we just add safety to that. Um, and so just based on what I've, I've heard from other, for other council members, and I did have a chance, Meredith and I talked a little bit about this one because she had particular concerns. So I came up with, um, a couple things on here and then um, we could just maybe start from there. Uh, number 10, transit and alternative transportations and then we're adding safety. So um, I kept A, so, well, there was nothing, there was not, that was the only one and then I've added several. So ensure that alternative transportation is required, incentivized in, um, in, in new development projects. So that's kind of general. And that was something that, um, you know, Colin asked for in that email. So um, I had a note to replace with more specifics. So um, I did, we were talking earlier about the um, HCOG and the um, rural transport, uh, the RTP. So if we have that as our, focus, um, you know, maybe get a presentation from HCOG about what that is, and then we focus on um, putting some, of, you know, putting some of those specifics in place. Yeah, I think, you know, th that plan is pretty comprehensive. And so I think, you know, if we state that we want to work towards implementing that plan, it will catch a lot of, um, you know, what we've been talking about as, as council, what, what staff has in interest and also a lot of what, um, you know, Colin sent forth uh, with that information as well. So I think that'll catch a lot of it. 
And so then um, these are the couple of them that Meredith and I talked about today. But um, so another one would be to work with, because I'm trying to figure out, like, you know, we have all people calling in, like, you know, we need things to be safer and for bicycle and pedestrians. So how do we go about that? So to work with the TSC, our Transportation and Safety Committee, um, and HCOG, okay, so this was just a better phrasing of this. So I put work with TSC and HCOG to identify a list of specific measures the city could take to implement aspects of the RTP. So that was, that cleans up that one. And then, um, the other one was to work with the TSC to identify specific measures to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety using ARPA funds. Um, I don't remember, I don't know, Karen, why we put ARPA funds, maybe because that's what they're, we have extra and that's what they're allocated for. I don't know. But um, I just felt like that's pretty, it's specific, but it's broad. So if we let the TSC do their job and really like start looking at roads and situations and come with us with some recommendations, like of how we could yeah. implement and be safer. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I just want to maybe give a quick update on that on you know, traffic safety, and you know, it's been coming up uh, quite a bit. Uh, late last year, or I would say mid last year, we got some funding through Caltrans to develop a local road safety plan. So we are in works. We will be working with one of the consulting firm and TSC to prepare our local road safety plan for the city of Arcata, and that'll be a in line with RTP, the goals that RTP has on safety. So just, you know, we can just maybe as a goal, and we have in our department goals too, to implement a local road safety plan in this year, 22-23. And that will, have, that will identify all the critical infrastructure where the improvements are needed, and we'll be working on those. So. Thank you. That's perfect. That's great. I can add that. I'll add the local road safety plan into the goal then. Okay. Anything, I mean, if we're trying to strategize and meet the goals of the RTP, we're probably um, in a good place here, but is there anything that we're forgetting or leaving out? Okay, so if not, um, it takes us to 12, and um, uh, I, Karen said we could cross that one off. They are doing that and are, um, are set for that. This, with, this is for the citywide disaster plans and improvement preparedness. Yeah. I feel like probably four to five years ago, you know, we really identified that our plans are very outdated. We had a lot of new staff. People weren't very well trained, and we really needed to refocus on emergency preparedness. And the council has now adopted that plan. Um, we have had a few setbacks with COVID. Uh, we've actually, but our staff have all gone through the CERT online training modules, and we're actually just starting this week over the course of the next three to four weeks now, uh, the in-person portion of that. So um, again, it's one of those things I feel like is, is pretty solidified in our work plans that it's going to continue. It doesn't need to be highlighted in your priority projects. Okay. Um, so that takes us to 13, which we've, uh, we have actually kind of touched on, but ma pro proactively maintaining a strong partnership with um, Cal Poly Humboldt, and I think that, you know, we knew this was important before they transitioned, and now we know it's even more important. Um, so A, continue to support Equity Arcata. B, um, I think that the, what Karen and I were talking about, the focus seems to have shifted. It seems that D Street was the priority before, but it's shifted to G Street. So if we um, kind of change that wording for that, and then, um, just see to continue to meet quarterly with Cal Poly and report out on, on that. Yeah, that all sounds great. And I kind of just wrote a few things down just to, to, you know, really continue to work with them and understand, you know, the needs of student population, um, and to work with them. Um, you know, I've had a couple conversations with associated students and, um, you know, has have mentioned this to, to Karen as well to have, you know, maybe, by, you know, twice a year, once a year, even, you know, some sort of town hall meeting, you know, where we have leadership from H, uh, from Cal Poly Humboldt, uh, city staff, associated students, people that all kind of have a vested interest in this and, you know, give that opportunity to connect with the public. Um, and then, 
I, I guess I'll just read what I wrote. Um, work with Cal Poly Humboldt to create a sense of community surrounding community art, cleanups, events, and continue to work with Cal Poly Humboldt to understand the needs of student population in regards to housing and transportation and work collaboratively to accomplish these needs and create more connectivity with the university. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just to, to let us, cause, cause what I really heard from associated students when I met with them was, you know, uh, th th it's always just like, oh, the, the students should get to know the community better, but the community should also get to know the students better. And so finding opportunities, whether it be through community cleanups, through painting murals together, community art projects, um, you know, going to events at the university, et cetera, that, you know, that's a two-way street that we are incorporating them as well. And they are incorporating us um, into their community. So I, I like that concept of um, like, maybe annually or whatever, um, you know, bringing our governments together and having some type of a, I don't know, a summit, a game of table tennis and basketball. <laughs> yeah, the chamber mixer on Thursday is with Cal Poly. I'm really excited to um, go and, and get to know. Is it in person? It is in person. It is at the um, Aquatic Center in Eureka. 530 to 730 on Thursday. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sure you can see Sarah. She'll give you her notes. That's Sarah's language, yes. That's like the annual convening. Okay. Um, and then 14 is explore options to expand our city council office meeting space. Um, just so that, um, you know, sometimes the public will say, oh, well, should I, you know, meet you at your office? And then Okay, well, you mean in my desk in my bedroom? No. Um, so uh, the rumor has it there is literally a storage closet that's going to be cleaned out and expanded a bit for us. So we'll with the window maybe in it so we could have a meeting space. So if we're still um, wanting to move that forward, then um, that's on here as well. I think especially two more more community members are wanting to meet in person. Um, I know I've spent a lot of money on coffee uh, <laughs> in the last uh, year or so. So, uh, you know, just having a space where, yeah, where they can come down and meet with us here. Um, it's easy. It's neutral. I think that's a good idea to at least, you know, keep number 14 on the priorities. Where would it be located? Where is the office to be located? Yeah. Um, so it, it basically, it rearranges the existing council space um, to create a meeting space and then we'll move, uh, I'll, I'll get you a copy of the plan, but I mean, it's a pretty basic plan. It expands the entry deck so that the door comes in further in so that we still have that exit way. And then basically builds the office in that, what would be the front corner of the building. Thanks. You know where that, like, there's that closet in there by our mailboxes. Mm -hmm. So that's literally, take the closet. literally we're getting a closet. <laughs> yes, because we're so because we're very fancy. <laughs> okay, so that takes us to the end of our list. What's um, is there anything that people brought that's not on there? Didn't make it in. I think we definitely incorporated the two big things that I wanted. Great job, Mayor. <clears throat> Um, there was one thing I was thinking we should consider. Um, the I think right now our policy is to uh, record all the committee meetings with audio recording and then keep those recordings for one year. Is that right? We keep them. I'd have to double check what the state statue is for keeping yeah. them. Um, it just it's it seems like um, we don't really keep very detailed. Uh, meeting minutes from a lot of the committee meetings um, and sometimes issues come up to where you know we're referencing committee meetings from longer than a year ago and uh, it just seems like it would be in the benefit of the city um, to kind of extend that from a year to maybe like three years to retain those recordings um, I think a good example is like really any major project that takes years to complete and goes through the committee over years um, if it's you know old Arcata Road roundabout project um, you know, maybe even something like the uh, the Gateway Project, where it's you know kind of in a long time in development, and um, you know there's been lots of meetings over time. Um, so you know the the staff or the council can go back and um, reference them if needed. Um, otherwise, we kind of lose all that that history. I 
Yeah, I was trying to think of that. I mean, like that's good, but it's specific. I was trying to think of it in broader terms because I think we've all talked about like wanting, you know, and this isn't something that necessarily has, you know, I guess walk it back. We've talked about better being better with public engagement and process and just kind of, you know, we've talked about um, kind of looking at what our different processes are. So um, I don't know if we want to, you know, just come up with a, a priority around that because it's something that we've been talking about and it doesn't seem like an expensive priority, um, but it is definitely a priority of ours to be more transparent, to be um, better for all of us at that. Um, and that could be a, you know, a part of it to um, maybe, you know, to look into such things as, you know, like record keeping or what we want to record or not. And then we could, you know, delve into it more because I know there's usually like what we might think is an easy idea. Sometimes there are like rules that go with it or whatever that make it more complicated, but at least we could talk more about process and that type of thing. Yeah, I think that would be a really good idea. And yeah, like you were saying, Brett, especially for really long ongoing projects that, you know, we know that if this is still going to be, you know, we're going to still be talking about it in three, four years that, you know, at least for that project or, you know, committee meetings or minutes, you know, about that project are saved through the, you know, adoption or completion of whatever said project it is. Again, I don't know what, you know, <laughs> laws exist around that or, or state statutes or, or what that be, but I, I do think, you know, that that is a valuable source of information for, for all of us for city staff for especially you know seeing new people come in and out and turnover of council and everything you know it's great to be able to go back and, and see it and have that information for ourselves so I think that you know that's a valuable conversation to have and I think you know yeah that public engagement piece and talking about how we can have you know a continuous cycle of improvement on that um, is important. So I think part of this is also stemmed, I've been corrected that it's a two years that we keep um, audio recordings at this point, but, and I think part of that has stemmed from when we really, we had them on cassette tapes, right? So there's been times that we had 13 committees, we had 12 meetings, there was 150 tapes every single year and they kept growing and growing. Um, so, I mean, uh, my, my gut would tell me, and we'll get back to the council on this, but that we're already archiving more than that. And with a transition to minute track for council meetings, it's a much easier transition now to be archiving those for a longer period of time. So I don't know if you, I mean, you could certainly put it as a goal, but if the council wants to say, you know, you'd like to do a minimum of three years tonight, we probably could just do that too. Yeah, no, I think it's important to make the policy. I mean, and please correct me if I, my memory's wrong. Um, you know, I remember when I first got on the council, we didn't record all the meetings. Um, there were a lot of meetings that went unrecorded. Um, so, you know, we brought that to the council and the council decided to kind of make an official policy to record all the meetings. Um, but maybe my memory's not correct. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, you know, it would be good just to kind of have, you know, something official um, to kind of hold ourselves accountable. I don't know if this is reasonable or not, but I liked what um, Councilman or Sarah said about, you know, maybe saving them until the completion for the bigger things, saving them until the completion of the project. But I don't, you know, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, maybe you know, I'd rather just say five years or ten years on everything, just because we don't like, you know, Gateway's going to go to five committees. Well, maybe it didn't go to Wetlands and Creeks because they didn't have a quorum that time, but it went to these other four. Like we're going to end up saving them. Then I think for we'll save all meetings for the duration of the most current project. Yeah, 10 years seems like, I don't, I think that's too long, but um, five, sounds I, great. Five, five sounds great. That's a good idea. Thanks. We'll add it to the goals and then we'll have one to check off the list next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I actually have one more goal that, uh, no, we're done. <laughs> Sorry, I was just reminded, um, I would really like to put something in about enhancing um, and strengthening our tribal relations, our relationships with tribal governments. Um, I know that's been something that I've been trying to, you know, kind of foster relationships. I think it's really important um, that that's something that we put in the forefront of our goals. Yeah, I agree with that. And I know after having my own conversations, I realized I think like all of us have been having conversations with our folks on staff about, yeah, including a land acknowledgement in our meetings, perhaps um, working with the Weot tribe to, um, you know, maybe even bring some, some signage to our, our city limits, things like that. Um, and I think that, you know, strengthening those relationships um, is really important. And I agree with that. I support that. 
Yeah, and um, Brett did bring that up recently, um, asking about the land acknowledgement and wanting that on the agenda. And I told him that um, uh, Meredith had been, like, you know, had kind of taken that up and was pursuing it, so it is coming. But I think we, I think we all agree on, on that aspect. Yeah, um, I think it's something we've been talking about for a while. So you know, I know we don't always have, um, we're not always to, able to communicate uh, with the tribe, but it'd be great if we were kind of persistent on that and kept pursuing it. Um, and then the last thing uh, I had mentioned um, to Stacy was I've noticed that um, we, you know, we have these tobacco shops around town and we have this vapor, vaporizer store on the plaza and um, they sell a lot of uh, disposable vaporizers basically that have batteries inside them. It's plastic, has batteries inside them and people use them and just throw them away. Um, and uh, I don't know, just from what I've seen, it seems like there's quite a few of these being sold in the city. And I just thought, you know, there's, there's also, um, you know, alternatives to where, people can get a more permanent device and, um, you know, refill it. And um, so I just thought it would be worth considering uh, to look at banning the, the sale of those disposable devices, just as kind of like a zero waste goal. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Bye. Totally goes with zero waste. And that's a really, it's a good niche one to think about though, because yeah, we do have quite a few shops that sell them, um, but I hadn't really thought about that. So thank you for bringing that up. I think, yeah, I think that's a good thing to pursue. And then the other one that has come up at a previous council meeting um, is on the development of an updated economic development strategic plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you guys can tell me where you want that if you want that added in. <laughs> well, probably don't in the economic development category. That's that is not I did. See, I was looking at the wrong paper. Yeah, direct EDC to create an economic strategic plan. Look at that. Yeah, and, I and, really appreciate you remembering that. Thank you. And I think that's coming up on a future agenda anyway, so exciting. So then I just wanted, I know um, several members of staff, you know, were able to speak up and, and talk about things that were on your list. Is there anyone who like, who hasn't been heard or wants to add things that for this? I would love to hear from the chief if you have anything that you want to say. No, I think, uh, I mean, we've got some, we've accomplished a lot of our goals uh, in this fiscal year, but uh, uh, I, I really don't have anything to add to the to the discussion tonight, other than when we build our new police department at some point in the future, we'll add some city council office space as well. So. Um, thank you. Um, how he's joking. We're going to get all kinds of emails. Um, <laughs> um, I know that um, we were trying to recruit and hire several, you know, new positions. Maybe you could just update us on how, how that's going. Yeah. And actually, you know, uh, through your support um, and city manager Deemers, uh, you know, we've, we had some funding to launch a recruiting and a campaign. We, it includes uh, uh, job flyers and um, advertisements and trade publications. And we're actually, tomorrow, we're making our second trip to College of the Siskiyous. Um, and it's, it's actually resulting in a lot of applications. Um, and we have some new recent hires, and we've got a couple of folks in the pipeline uh, to be hired. And, and I think, you know, with uh, Assistant City Manager Danette DeMello bringing on board the NeoGov um, application process, it had, that has been a game changer. Uh, for us to take basically a handwritten application where someone would have to come into City Hall and to put that process online. Um, I think we've received since the beginning of the year over 40 applications. So, so the recruiting is going well, as is the retention. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and hope with this current council. Um, and, and the people in the police department feel supported and they feel part of uh, 
all the great things that are happening in the city and they take a lot of pride in, in keeping it safe so that all of your goals and programs can thrive. So it's good that people are, you know, continuing to keep the police department their home. We did lose a few folks, primarily to neighboring agencies, but you know, I'll support anyone who, who wants to transition. Um, but we were also um, positioning ourselves to lose upwards of three additional um, officers, and they all saw sort of this uh, good news and enthusiasm happening, and they chose to stay here. So we're, we're actually doing well, and it's giving us an opportunity to maybe expand on some of our, like, homeless um, operations in support of your goals. So more on those, you know, opportunities to follow, and all that is predicated on our ability to continue to hire. So it's going well. Thank you. If you have the energy, we thought maybe we'd just run through a little overview of the capital improvement program, just to familiarize before we get into budget. All right. It's up to you. <laughs> All right. Hi, right, so I'll make this fairly brief. Um, so as Nature said, um, kind of when I started here, I kind of take a, taken over the capital improvement program. And so um, you'll see a lot of these projects again in the new five-year uh, CIP that's going to be coming out this year with budget. Um, they'll be a little different, a little bit more detailed. It'll have um, some uh, some history, hopefully for up to five years out for those projects that have multiple years, um, have some budget, revenue sources, uh, and different things like that, different phases, whether it's planning, design, or construction, because um, some projects may only have one or, or multiple phases. So there'll be more details um, coming out. There'll be all of these same projects that you see here. Um, but I was going to take this time just to go over a few of these projects. As you can see, it's a pretty big list. I don't know that I need to hit every single one, but maybe just kind of touch bases <laughs> on a few that have been completed this year. Um, and then maybe a few others uh, that the new projects that we've talked about, some of them were already brought up. So I don't know that we need to go into detail with those, um, but then also just touch uh, on any of those that you guys have questions on uh, specifically. So um, I'll just go ahead and get started. So some of the, the more recent ones that uh, hopefully you guys have seen uh, around town have been completed are some of the annual paving projects. So we actually have two uh, annual paving projects um, that are going on. One is a, what we call a grind and inlay project. And that was completed, I believe, just before Christmas. And we took certain areas of the street that were in bad shape. We ground them down and just uh, basically filled them back in and replaced them. And so, um, and then we have another one, which is just our annual paving project, which is essentially more of a grind and inlay or um, an overlay project, pretty much the full width of the roadway along multiple streets throughout Arcata. And so that project, there's, there's also a few sidewalk and curb ramps improvements. Um, and that is the one that uh, you guys mentioned earlier about on G Street um, that we're looking to have, have paid pretty soon, but that, that G Street is included in that project. So. The majority of the side streets um, are completed and paved thus far, and as well as the curb ramps, um, and pretty much all that's left on G Street is G Street, and that hopefully will be happening here in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, kind of been a little bit waiting on the weather. They just finished some of the the minor things that were needed to get to get ready for the paving, and now we're just waiting for a good window. So um, those are the paving projects. Uh, we also have. Um, like another annual project is annual uh, sidewalk improvement project, and you've probably seen a number of those going on as well. It's kind of similar to curb ramps. Um, and so that's pretty much done. We've had one or few, one or two minor uh, curb ramps to finish, uh, for, but for the most part, that one's done. Um, and kind of a, a one-off, not this is, wouldn't be like an annual type project uh, that is nearly complete, is 30th Street. Um, it's off of Alliance Road. So yeah, it's about 700 feet of what used to be just a gravel road. Um, that's now a two lane road. It's got uh, some LID improvements. It's got a 10 foot wide multi-use path along the side um, that leads to uh, development there. And then on the far side of development is a 140 foot uh, long pedestrian bridge. Um, so that one is nearly done. Essentially um, everything's complete to, at this point with the exception of some bridge lighting. Um, and that'll be done probably in about two months. All right, and then let's see. And then we also have Larson Park Tennis Court resurfacing that was completed. Um, I think that was just kind of a, a new painting of striping, just kind of making it look nice and new. And then also the plaza improvement, the um, planter removal at the plaza. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that project. That was 
that was completed as well. So, um, and then one more actually um, annual manhole and sewer line replacement project. So that's one that's that's um, an annual one. As you're as you're obviously seeing, there's a number of like water, sewer, and road type projects that just happen on an annual basis. So. Even though these were completed this year, obviously they'll show up again next year, or hopefully next year, or may skip a year, depending on uh, the projects, the size of the budget, and, and what we have going on. So those um, are the majority of the existing ones that were completed, and then the annual ones, and then we touched on a few of the new ones. Um, we've got four new ones. Um, I think uh, we talked about uh, Bloomfield Park a little bit, so I'll skip that one. The Arcadia Community Center facility upgrades as well, I'll skip that one, and um, land acquisition for sea level rise. So we hit those. The only one we didn't talk about was the sewer infiltration uh, reduction. Um, it's a big project, hopefully uh, 10 to $12 million. And so um, we were hoping to get a grant for the majority of that project. So that is a, a multi-year project. Um, it might be two or three years, uh, and hopefully, Hopefully that we'll get the grant to, to do that. So that's basically trying to reduce the amount of groundwater that's entering our system um, by by either uh, well a number of different ways, but uh, sometimes replacing pipes, sometimes running a new line through it, and just to 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 seal any of the cracks and joints. Um, and so that was the majority of the update and the touch up ones that I was going to hit. Are there any questions that you guys have on any specific projects? I just want to say I'm so excited about G Street. Um, it, it might be the one of my greatest accomplishments since being on council is uh, getting that paved. And um, can I put my handprints in it and paving it? No, can't do that. All right. Yeah, you, you won't like that. <laughs> I would maybe just add on for the um, project that David just touched on for the sewer inflow and infiltration reduction project, that those projects really tie directly also to just our capacity um, at the wastewater treatment plant. So of the investment um, that these you know, projects really could then serve us later for just future capacity at the wastewater treatment plant. And just to add a little bit more detail, in essence, you know, I consider our wastewater treatment plant to we have significant capacity during dry weather flow. But we have very limited capacity during wet weather flow. So it's this combination of building additional infrastructure to treat more wastewater as we grow and fixing pipes so that we have less intrusion of water that then we have to treat at the plant that both build capacity. So I think that's where you say it's not always, and I'd love to say we've done a big I, &I project, right? And then we entered into a drought. So we would love to say to the community how many millions of gallons we've saved from going into those pipes. Because, but, 80 million gallons, we've saved. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the last project. And you, less water in the wastewater. Yeah. Over how much? Over one year. Over one year period. Um, but we've also been in a drought. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a sad thing, but yes. Yeah. We are still monitoring it, and we will provide an update once we have a good result and a good rainfall data. We'll come back and let you know how much less water is going to the wastewater. Yeah, so working projects both sides build capacity within that system. So I think the, the last thing that just for us to consider um, is if we, last time we, we actually didn't consider these when we went through our goal setting last year because we just had such a robust process, but if we feel fine with what the current goals are, you know, or um, which they're just, you know, they're, they're general and I, I well, were you going to um, talk at all about all the, um, the goals from the different, like the kind of requested goals from the different departments? Well, as we were going through, they we were, yeah, we did. They were like speaking up. And so that's why I just did this final call. Like, did we leave anything out? So I think that everybody feels heard. Okay. I mean, I would just add that, um, you know, if the council agrees, I think if there's anything that wasn't mentioned, um, if there's things that the um, city manager identifies um, that might be important uh, for us to work on to just bring those back to us at the next council meeting. Is that, I've lost my agenda in all this paperwork. Are we, are we at the end? <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, you are, unless there's any updates that you want to make. Well, I think we all You're thought all it was oh, fine. Can I maybe add the word climate change in here? Can I do that somewhere um, and bring it back? Oh, well, yeah, maybe because it says environmental leadership. So. But uh, yeah, I think it would be good to maybe add something in there, especially too, because we added the, the goal about addressing sea level rise um, and adding that underneath our little environmental leadership section, um, you know, to show again that we're thinking about climate change, we're talking about sea level rise. It should be kind of the thread running through all of our projects that we do and something that we should be, you know, thinking about and, and worried about, frankly. So um, I think adding that there would be great. Can you remind me again, like what was our discussion about um, public engagement and wanting to, where, where did we leave that? I think, did we add to our goals? Yeah, we added, um, did we do anything specific or did we leave that up to you to? I think Sarah add, added some language around the, um, the gateway specifically to include and then it's one of our top priorities in the department, but I don't know that we have a specific set aside goal or policy. Yeah, I think when we talked about this, um, when I had asked about this, uh, I don't know, several meetings back, um, that we just wanted to maybe look at everything we do for public engagement, um, just kind of assess it and see, you know, if we have any ideas on how to continue to improve it. Yeah, and I think staff just needed some time to gather that, but they, but we all agreed that that should be like a, you know, a priority to discuss. Yeah. Okay, so we'll leave that off goals and we'll keep it on our future agenda setting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's make it a goal. All right. You know, we'll make it a goal. I, I can. I mean, I. I, I I don't see why it would hurt. Okay. I mean, yeah, to, to add just, you know, as a priority to, you know, assess our community engagement and re remain yeah. transparent and productive as any city council should. So, I mean, I think that should be a priority. Yeah. I'm, ha I'm happy with adding that if other folks want to. Yeah. No, I think like a general category is great. And then we can specifically put that under there because we've already asked for it. And then we can cross that one off, but we'll have to keep the main one on there because we'll always have to be doing that. Um, so yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Great. Great. Okay. So I, I just want to say this has been a really lovely process and I, I think it's really good because it, um, you know, sometimes we can get bogged down in details and in, you know, and issues and things. And, um, I feel like this really tonight showed our community that we are, that we all are on the same page and we really do have the same goals that we, we do know how to work together to get this done. And I think that we, I would love to see this energy move forward. Um, I think that would just be great for all of us. So thank you everybody for, for this productive meeting. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you too. It's really also super nice to sit in a room with all of you and talk about this stuff finally and not have to squint as I make out who it is in a tiny zoom box on the screen. So it's really just great to see everybody and hopefully we get to do more of this soon and keep it going. So like tomorrow, like tomorrow, <laughs> like tomorrow. Yeah. Meeting adjourned.